right, team, let's go ahead and uh, begin for the day. Yeah. Uh, so I looked at the I looked at the schedule, and last week we did lab nine, right? We did the telescope lab, mm -hmm. but we didn't. We did. I, sorry, I goofed on you guys. We skipped lab eight entirely, right? So we didn't do that. We skipped the eclipse lab. So we got ahead of ourselves and we did the telescope lab before doing the eclipse, which isn't in the, end of the world. Like the information isn't going to be a big deal. We'll just go back now and take care of the eclipses right now. So I'm going to go ahead and jam through the lecture here, and uh, then we'll get started on lab eight for today. All right. So. <laughs> Uh, so we have here, you all remember the ecliptic, right? We have the celestial sphere and the ecliptic, right? Uh, so the celestial sphere was a, was a sphere, the imagined sphere, right, with all the objects in the universe placed or projected, if you will, onto the sphere, including the, the sun, right? The sun is also included in that. Does anybody remember what the, uh, what the ecliptic, what the ecliptic represents, what it, what it is? Yes. That's it exactly. So it's the imagined path that is the sun's path over the course of a year, and it's basically we, we take that sun, our orbit around the sun, and we pretend that we hold ourselves in constant. You would imagine the sun going around us. So it's the imagined path that the sun goes around over the course of a year uh, along the uh, celestial sphere here. So that's going to be our ecliptic. Very good. So that's the two things we got to recall from previous technologies. If we look more closely at the ecliptic, right, here we have this ecliptic. This is going to be the, the uh, axis of rotation for the, uh, for the Earth. And this is the, what, is, what was this called? Well, I guess it's right there. So this is the celestial equator, right? It's just the, the equator projected onto the celestial sphere. And there you have it. That's the, uh, the sun going around the Earth along the celestial sphere, along the ecliptic. So you got to think, uh, I mean, we already went over it quite a bit, but it's really just a matter of perspective. If you hold the Earth constant and you pretend that the sun is going around us, then that's what you're going to get. And it's kind of like, I have my example here with the vehicles. Like if you're driving 60 miles per hour and you see somebody standing on the side of the road, when you tear past them, you know, they're going to appear to be going 60 miles backwards. From their perspective, you're going to be appearing to go 60 miles forwards per hour. Uh, but the other thing is, if you have, you say you're driving up against a car that's doing 60 and you're doing 60 at the same time, you're both going to appear to be stationary. The other example I'd give of this one is if any, any of you remember Futurama, so we got the Planet Express ship from Futurama, right? So that's uh, the engines on that ship don't actually move the ship at all, it just moves the universe around it, right? So it's all a matter of perspective. Uh, in this case, we're having the sun go around us. But, but note, of course, that, this, that the sun does not orbit around us. We orbit around the sun. It's just a perspective thing. All right. All right. Cool. So, so today's lab is all about eclipses. So uh, in that vein, we've got to have, we got to design a new system. So we're going to talk about a new reference frame in which we can actually start describing uh, these eclipses and even go ahead and try to predict them. So we have here, we have two, two of these uh, circles, right, two of these orbital paths. Here you have the plane of the sun's orbit, so that's going to be the ecliptic, right? And here you have the plane of the moon's orbit. So here this is the path that the moon takes. So this is all based on the celestial sphere, right? So this is all the objects in the universe projected on to the sphere, all of them with the Earth in the center held fixed. So this is the path that the moon takes going around the Earth. It's approximately 30 days for one orbital path, uh, completion for the moon. To move. It takes 30 days for the moon to go around the, sun, the Earth once. It takes 365 days for the Earth to go around the sun, or in this case, for the sun to complete its path along the ecliptic. So that's 365 days red. For the moon there, it's going to be 30 days. It's going to be important when we're talking about uh, the different coordinate systems for this new system, this new frame of reference. Because the idea here is we want to figure out when these eclipses occur, what type of eclipses they are, why they occur, and can we predict them in the future. So let's talk about, let's talk about these nodes. Okay. So we have two types of nodes. We have ascending nodes and we have descending nodes. Now what the nodes are, 
the nodes are going to be your intersection points between the path of the sun and the path of the moon. So if you look back at this other page here, the other slide, right? You see there the, uh, the two intersecting points, the orbits intersect here. Those are going to be the points called the nodes, right? Those are going to be your points of intersection between the two orbital paths. So at these nodes, that's where you're going to get your eclipses, right? So how can you tell if it's an ascending node or a descending node? The, node, the fact that it's a node makes sense, right? Everyone's pretty clear on that. If the orbital paths intersect, or wh wherever they intersect, those are going to be your nodes. So you have two nodes, because you have two intersecting orbital paths. Right? Now the question is, is it ascending or descending? So usually what we like to do is we like to take the, the ecliptic, the path of the sun, and we make that our horizontal. Because that makes sense. The plane of the sun, the plane of the solar system is the horizontal. So if you take us going around that, that should be the horizontal one. So then the moon is going to be the one off on an angle. So what you do here is you look at the path of the moon and compare it to the path of the sun. And if the path of the moon, right, as it goes over, comes from underneath the ecliptic, so as it's coming up, it's coming from the bottom up, right? It passes through that node from, from bottom to up. That's going to be your ascending node. And that makes sense, right? Ascending is something that is like rising in space, right? So, so you have the ascending node when the moon goes from below the ecliptic to above. And then conversely, you have the descending node when the moon's path goes from above the ecliptic to below. So as you can see, it's coming from below to up, and then repeating the cycle. Right? That's not too shabby. Key note there is the five degrees of angular separation between the two paths, right? That's going to be very important when we're talking about uh, the ecliptic latitude later on. So let's, let's take a look. Uh, so here's a, this is of course not to scale, but this is maybe a more accurate representation of what we have going on here. So there's the sun. This is going to be the path of the Earth going around the sun, which we of course know is also the ecliptic in the celestial sphere frame of reference. But here we have the moon's orbital path, the lunar orbit. That moon's orbital path, as it goes through, you can see it's coming from below that, that orbital, the ecliptic here. It says Earth's orbit, but it's the same as the ecliptic, right? It's just a different perspective. So it's coming from below that ecliptic to above. There you have your ascending node. Coming from above down to below, you have your descending node. And already you can sort of see, when the moon is down here, it's not, there's no way it's in alignment with the sun, right? It's, it's, it's not in alignment at all. So it's maximum negative position, right? But when it's at this descending node, you have an alignment between the sun, the earth, and the moon. And whenever you have that type of alignment where they're right stacked on top of each other, that's when you're going to have your eclipses, right? So that's how you can see that we have these eclipses occurring uh, at these nodes. So here we go, uh, just putting it, being more explicit about it. When the orbital path of the moon and the orbital path of the sun, the ecliptic, right? When they intersect, you have your nodes. At those nodes are going to be your eclipses, right? And the idea being here, if uh, I'm going to draw it on the board maybe, the idea being here, if you have, so, so the idea being here is that the sun, so we, remember, we all remember the angular size, right? We talked about this like lab one. Uh, so it's a bit, bit far away, but you'll remember that you were able to stick your hand out at full arm's length, right? And that represents like five degrees, the angular size of five degrees. And you could do that to like compare, like see what the size of the full moon was. You could see how far objects are apart from each other. Let's say you have the moon and you have some planet up in space, they're both in the sky, you want to see how far the angular separation is. You can stick your hand out and sort of do a quick uh, estimation. But it's all about angular size. So on the extra credit question on lab one, uh, maybe it was lab two, it was one of the early labs, but the extra credit question on that, was how many times larger or smaller is the moon compared to uh, Mars, the angular size? The idea being the moon, when it's the full moon, is pretty big in the sky, right? It's a giant uh, glowing orb but it's in the sky at night. Bless you. A planet, however, is going to be a tiny dot. It's hard to, to tell the difference between a planet when you're looking at it uh, in the night sky with the naked eye compared to a star. So clearly, the angular size of the moon is many, many, many times larger than the angular size of, in that case, it was Mars. We happen to live at, in a time period where the moon's angular size is about the same as the angular size of the sun, which means if we call this the sun, 
the moon's angular size is basically the same thing. Which means that even though the sun is extraordinarily much, like, is a lot bigger, as we all know, the, the sun is extremely large compared to everything in the, in the solar system, the sun's also very far away. So, because the moon's much closer, it looks a lot bigger, and we just happens to, it just happens to be far enough away that it looks to be just the same size as the sun. Which is important, because if you get that overlap where you have the moon overlapping the sun, that alignment, right? Well, then you get this nice thing where you have both the sun and the moon in the same position, and you can't see, you can't see the sun behind the moon because the moon is just the right size. But let's say that the moon was a little closer, so the angular size of the moon is a little bigger, you would have something more like this, where there's the sun, the moon's coming over, but the moon is like this, so it's much bigger, you can't see the sun behind the moon, and you're not going to get as spectacular an eclipse, because the, you know, the moon takes up all of the sun, and it's very nice, but you get the total darkness, but you're not going to be able to see that nice ring, you're not going to be able to see the corona, so if you look at that picture back there, that's going to be the totality, that's, that's what we're after. That's the beauty of having the same angular size for the sun and the moon. Conversely, if this is the sun and the moon is smaller, like in this picture, when the moon passes over the sun, it's going to be much smaller, right? So if that's the moon right here and that's the sun, uh, it's not going to make a total eclipse. You still see all the sun. You see a lot of the sun just peeping out from behind the moon, and so you wouldn't get a very spectacular darkening effect or anything near what we have going on there. Uh, but the idea being here is that when you're at these nodes, right, that's going to be the time when the sun and the moon are in the same exact location at, you know, at the same time. Outside of that, when you see these, when the moon and the sun begin to separate, you have times where this is the sun, maybe, and the moon is going to be there too, but it's lower down on the horizon. Like, so this is the horizon, you have the sun above it and the moon down here. And so in this case, of course, you're not going to get an eclipse. And just to, just to make one thing, I mean, I'm going to talk about it more in a bit, but each, I said that the path of the sun here is 365 days, right? That means that each tick mark on this represents about a day. So the moon's going around much faster than the sun is going around. You can imagine that. The sun's going around very slowly, the moon's going around very fast. So, so for those things to align, it's, it's not as common as, you know, it's, 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 it's rare, right? That's why eclipses don't happen all the time, but they do happen. What? All right. So let's talk about the system. So we've talked about what we want from the system. Let's talk, let's define some stuff. So this is going to be our eclipse system, right? And just like any other system we have, you're going to have to have coordinate axes, right? So does anybody remember uh, what the coordinates are for the Earth? Just the normal Earth coordinates. Just when, if you want to say, oh, I know, I found a treasure chest on this island, and you want to tell me where the coordinates are for that, what would you tell me? You'd give me the longitude and latitude. Longitude and latitude, right? That's pretty straightforward. Very good. So, what are the longitude and latitude equivalents, not in any particular order, for the celestial uh, system? Bless you. So remember, one was measured in hours, the other was measured in degrees. So, so we have longitude and latitude for the Earth's uh, system, right? The Earth's mapping system. What do we have? What are the coordinate names for the celestial sphere? It's the bubble, yeah. It's that bubble. It's this thing here, right? And so it has its grid, grid lines as well. It has those, uh, the you know, horizontal lines and the vertical lines. So we remember those are going to be your right ascension lines and your declination lines. So that's what we have for the celestial system. One last chance, what do you, does anybody remember for the horizon system, what the coordinates were for that? This was on the practice quiz. I might have put it on the, on the radio, but I don't remember. Hmm? I'm sorry? So it, it depends on the observer, right? Because the because the horizon system was all de observer dependent. Uh, but we did have two we had two ways of, of just describing what we had. So we had we had how high something was in the sky, and that was going to be our altitude, right? That stays pretty consistent. How high is it from the horizon? That's your altitude. 
And then you also have that azimuthal angle, so how far uh, in this direction is it going to be? So those are the two coordinates for that. So let's define some coordinates for our eclipse system, right? So we have two new ones, ecliptic longitude and ecliptic latitude. So two, two more coordinates to add to your repertoire of coordinates that you should know. <laughs> but here we go. So ecliptic longitude, ecliptic latitude. You're, you're, maybe you, you're familiar with these terms because you sometimes see them uh, in the lab, uh, in the lab, what is it called, the uh, Starry Night program, right? Like, which, which one do I use? So, let's talk about it. Alright, let's talk about the latitude first. So, we said that if we take the plane of the sun, the plane of the, the solar system, we talked about that ecliptic, and we take that and make it a horizontal, we have our moon's orbital path going at an angle. The angular separation between these two paths, that is your ecliptic latitude. So it's pretty straightforward. Right? You go from positive 5, so that's the maximum distance you're going to get, the maximum angular separation, positive 5 degrees. You go down, you're decreasing this angular size until you get to the intersection point, right, between the two orbits. That's going to be, what do you guys think that's going to be? What kind of degrees? So we have, so let's say we have positive 5 degrees here, it goes down, it hits this, it keeps going until it reaches the maximum minimum, uh, the, the greatest minimum, which is going to be your negative 5 degrees. So it goes between 5 degrees and negative 5 degrees. Halfway between it, the intersection point is going to be what? Zero. Zero degrees, right? Perfect. So, boom, you already know something very important. You might want to jot this down somewhere on your notes or whatever. You will always have a node at a zero degree latitude. So if your ecliptic latitude is zero degrees, you know you got a node. Then you got to ask yourself, well, what type? And we'll talk about that in a minute. But that's a key takeaway. When the ecliptic latitude is zero degrees, you've got a node. Plain and simple. Yep. So that's going to be the latitude system, right? That's going to be the latitude coordinate thing, right? So we got to talk about the longitudinal coordinates as well. So we have the ecliptic longitude, and that's going to be from the ecliptic side of things, right? So the longitude, the way it's divide, uh, designed, <laughs> is each mark here represents a degree. So it's measured in degrees. Both of these are measured in degrees. But the ecliptic longitude goes around along the ecliptic. So here we, here we'll, we'll, start the, we'll start the zero point. So our zero degree mark is going to be here at the first point of Aries, which in your book I think it equates to March 21st. That's going to be the first day of spring in March. That's just, the, that's just convention. So just note that the first point of Aries is March 21st. That's where the zero degree mark is. So I, if I was going to write on this thing, which I will not do, I would write this equals zero degree. All right. But let's talk about the separation, like, like, the, like the counters. So we know that the sun goes around the Earth, uh, along the ecliptic 365 days in a year. But as uh, astronomers to be, we're going to be scientists, we're going to use physics. We like to do a thing called hand waving. Uh, hand waving which essentially is saying, let's do a, a big approximation. So, we're going to approximate the year to be 360 days. Why? Because we can. So we're going to say 360 days in the year, and we know how many degrees are in a full rotation of a circle. How many degrees are in a full circle? 360 degrees, right? Well, that's pretty nice math. I like that. So if we do that, we see, let's do a little division here and, and see what we get. What, uh, so we get the division here. What does that equal? Well, that's uh, about a degree a day, yeah? Ever see that? Which makes things really simple for us. Because that means that if, it's, if everything here, all the degrees counts to about a day, and I tell you that this date here at zero degrees is March 21st, and every degree counts as a day, what would 10 degrees be? This is March 31st, right? Because it's just 10 days later. So, that's telling you immediately that if you take any of these degrees, you can correspond that to a month. So I say, well, what's 30 degrees? What month would that be? So March, we have March at the first. What's this going to be? April. April, right? And so on and so forth. So that means that if you have a degree, you also have a month, which is pretty important when we're talking about when things happen, right? Because now we can say, I know what month that node's at, and I know what month that eclipse is at. Which is what we want to do. We want to start predicting some of these eclipses, right? It's kind of cool. I can say, oh, I know when the next eclipse is going to be. There's supposed to be one in Europe either soon or maybe it already happened. I didn't go to see it. 
And I had a professor that was like, I'm putting together this trip, we're gonna do this thing. I'm like, oh, that's awesome, man, let's do it. No, it's all right, it's too busy. So is everybody cool on this kind of thing? We have a degree a day for the ecliptic longitude. We have a positive five to a negative five on the latitude with the zero points being nodes, right? So that's pretty, pretty straightforward, all right. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the orbital path of the moon. So we'll get more into this later when we start talking about Kepler's laws and talk about the law of ellipses. But here we have the fact that the moon is going around the Earth uh, in an elliptical orbit. Just like the Earth goes around the sun, just like everything in the solar system goes around the sun in an elliptical path, the moon also does that. And so what's the takeaway? What does that mean? Well, that means that there's a point along this orbit where the moon is closest to the Earth, and there's a point where it's farthest away. So that's going to be your perigee. So this is the two vocab to note here. When the moon is at perigee, it's closest to the Earth. And when the moon is at apogee, it's farthest from the Earth. Right? So pretty straightforward. Uh, thing to remember, perigee means closest, apogee means farthest, right? And what is that, what are the takeaways here from angular size? Would you expect the angular size of the full moon at perigee to be bigger or smaller than the angular size of the moon at apogee? So is this moon gonna look bigger in the sky or is this moon gonna look bigger in the sky? The, uh, the perigee one, right? The perigee is gonna look bigger because it's closer. Right? So I think I think Monday is they was a super moon. I don't know what that means. Because it's just it's just a word. If they said Monday is gonna be a full full moon where the moon's at perigee, well that would make a lot more sense because they'd say, oh, we get the full moon, it's at perigee, so it's the closest, that's gonna be a huge full moon. It's gonna look amazing. I mean, I don't really tell you it's called a super moon, so I don't know what it means. Uh, gotta use you gotta use your vocabulary, right? It's our science. Uh, but that's the takeaway here. So, so comparing these, this distance to this distance, would you expect this is going to be the smallest or the biggest distance? This is the smallest distance, right? So we get the smallest distance here at perigee and the largest distance there at apogee. Just something to take note of because you're going to have you know, questions in the lab, that kind of thing. So that's something to take away. And then, of course, you, we did phases, right? So you, so you remember the phases coming. You get the sunlight coming from this right side here, and it sort of shines on half of the objects there, or each half the sun half versus the dark half. You can tell the phase from that, right? Something else I want to talk about. It's a little mathy, but it's not bad. It's pretty straightforward. We did math. Space Lab has some math. And we're talking about eccentricity. So, this is the elliptical path. This is the elliptical orbit. As we know, an ellipse has two foci, right? So it has two center points, if you will. A circle only has one. Because the idea being here, the more you squish this in to make this look like a circle, the more these two foci are going to kind of converge until they intersect and they're at the same point. Boom, you got a circle, right? But we don't have a circle, we have an ellipse. So we have two foci, right, with the Earth at one and the other foci being empty space. And you have the moon going around the Earth. So here is an apogee, right? That's the farthest point, the biggest distance. Here we have perigee, closest point, smallest distance. And here we have the moon at different points in time. So. The idea here is this. You have uh, different distances from your moon, from the object that's orbiting, in this case the moon, you have different distances from the two foci, right? Here we have an A from this foci distance, the distance for that foci is a B. So this A and this B, those are two different lengths, right? Well, the sum of A and B is going to be a number, right? It's just gonna be the sum total of the distances from the foci, right? As the position of the moon changes, the sum total of the distance between the object and the foci is constant. So, what does that mean? It means that as, these, as this moon goes around the Earth, the sum of the two lengths between the foci, right? So if you had something here, you have two lengths between the foci, you have this length here, and then you have this other length here, maybe we'll call that E and F, right? So that the length is gonna change if you've got the moon here, you got that length, that length, right? Alpha and beta, whatever. You're gonna have different lengths as you go around. Here it's this and this. The sum total of whatever two lengths you get is gonna be the same, regardless of where the moon is along the orbit path. So A plus B equals C plus D equals alpha plus beta, gamma plus what, epsilon, I don't know. 
Does that make sense? That the, the length changes to make sure that the sum is the same. Because if you look here, the C corresponds to the A, right? You were talking about the distance between this folder. But here, the C is longer, and here the A is shorter. So as the moon's coming closer and closer to apogee, this distance between the moon and this foci is going to get smaller and smaller, while this one gets bigger and bigger. And so as this one gets bigger, it compensates for the fact that this one gets smaller. Cool stuff. It's not too shabby, right? Maybe. Yeah, it's rubber banding. Yeah, it's rubber banding. Longer. Exactly. You know, I, based on the idea of rubber band, I was kind of I wanted to make my own like uh, like demo of this kind of thing. You know, maybe you can have like some kind of two rubber bands or what have you, and you can see them cha changing length as you bring it around. I haven't done that, so you guys don't get to see it. But maybe next semester's lab, I'll, I'll make one. It's pretty straightforward. Oh, I mean, maybe somebody here wants to make one. I don't know. Maybe that could be worth some. I don't know. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> but you know. I do have a pool of extra credit points that I don't tell you how to get, but you have options to get. You just gotta sort of find, you know, if somebody brings me like this thing that they built and I'm like, oh, that's badass, like, I'm gonna give you something for it. So, just throwing it out there. We have a weekend, there's no class tomorrow. I don't know. So, what is, uh, what is, uh, what is the point? So we got eccentricity here, let's talk about that. Eccentricity basically is a measure of how elliptical your orbit is. So here we have a couple of different eccentricities. This one's <laughs> eccentricity equals zero equals zero. You got a circle. Two foci, boom, converge to one, you got a circle. Eccentricity of zero, circle. The larger that eccentricity is approaching one, the more elliptical that orbital path is going to be. Right? So our orbit around the, Earth, uh, around the, the sun you're going to expect to be somewhat close to zero because we're, we're pretty circular. We don't really, you know, slingshot around like a comet would, right? So you have stuff like comets, you know, if this is the sun, you got a comet coming in, maybe way out there from the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt or what have you. That thing's going to be, you know, we'll talk about, we'll talk about it when we get to Kepler's laws. We're talking about different, you know, different speeds, equal areas, equal time. But, it's slow as it's out here until it gets really close to the sun and then this thing shuts out, right? So that's going to be your eccentricity very close to one. So this is going to be approximately, you know, pretty close to one. Well, what about something that's bigger than one, right? So we've talked about the extremes, but what about, what about something that's bigger than one? What does that mean? Well, that's when you have a hyperbolic orbit. So that's, that's the same idea. Let's say you have a comet coming in from, again, from, from deep space. You got something like the Oort cloud, what have you. That comet's coming in. And it's, it's getting near the sun, and then it slingshots out, but it never comes back. That thing is getting just out of deep space, we'll never see it ever again. It's not in an orbit. That's going to be an eccentricity greater than one, right? The hyperbolic orbits. So, just something to take note of, because in the lab we're going to talk about, we're just going to ask you, what's the eccentricity of the moon? And just like the Earth, you're going to expect something that's pretty close to zero, because it's pretty close to a circle. So. If you're getting something that's close to one, you know you you know you got to recheck your calculations because the orbits it's not like a comet it's not slingshotting around like that, right? All right, so let's get into to the meat of it. Right, this is the last thing I'm going to cover. I'm just going to talk to you about what eclipses look like and what to expect when you have certain nodes. So here we have the two types of eclipses, right? You have your lunar eclipse and you have your solar eclipse. And the eclipse is all about the shadow. Right? It's all about the shadow. So here we got the sun, orbital, the, so we got the orientation, right, the alignment. We have the sun, then you got the moon, then you got the earth. And so the sun is being blocked by the moon, which casts a shadow on the earth. So just note, of course, it's pretty straightforward. Solar eclipse, this is the orientation you got. It's always sun, earth, got it? Sun, moon, earth, right? Something to take away, that shadow, because, because the moon, because the moon is the same size, the same angular size as the sun, right? Because of that, this moon, when you look at it from the Earth's perspective, barely covers the sun. Therefore, the shadow that it casts is very small, right? Comparing it to the Earth, which completely overtakes the sun, the sun looks like this compared to the moon, and the Earth looks like this, you know? So when that thing covers the, uh, when, the when the Earth covers, the, this is from the moon's perspective, when the Earth covers the Sun, you have this huge shadow that's cast over the Moon, right? So that's going to be your, your distinction. 
And what does that mean? Well, that means that the lunar eclipse lasts a lot longer than the solar eclipse. Because that shadow is moving across the surface of the Earth as the Earth rotates as the moon is changing in its orbit. And here, the same thing, you know, the, the shadow is going to be moving, but because it's such a big shadow, the, the, Earth, the moon as it uh, moves around through that shadow is still going to be covered for, entire, for a while. So lunar eclipse lasts a lot longer than solar eclipse. And you can see there the, three different the two different types of shadows. You get the umbra, which is going to be your main shadow, the darkest part, the full shadow in here. You get penumbra, which is going to be your partial shadow. Well, we're seeing the moon, like bright orange. Yeah. Is that the umbra, or is that? So that's going to be the umbra. It turns, so what, and during a lunar eclipse, yeah, you have the, we call it the blood moon, right? It's a good time to do a certain, I mean, it's called the blood moon, so it's a good time to look at it. That's going to be when your moon turns to that nice orange reddish color, that, that dark, you know, that blood color, right? It's when it's going through that umbra, it's going through that main dark shadow. Yeah. That's because the Earth is kind of moving, the sun is highlighting all. Is that because of the stuff in the atmosphere? The color. As far as the color goes, it's got to be due to. It's a good question. Uh, I mean, you have this, the brightness of the, of the, you have the brightness, you have the material that the, the moon is made of. And maybe that contributes to the different types of the wavelengths because we talked about the optical, the visible part of the spectrum last, last lab, right? And so it's basically what type, what type of thing, what type of that wavelength is being reflected into your eyes? So maybe it's due to the material that the moon's made out of, uh, that the shadow turns it into this red color because certain wavelengths are being kept and certain wavelengths are turned to your eyes. Uh, as far as specifically why I'm not, I'm not sure. But, uh, but yeah, but yeah, so you're gonna get your dark red colored moon in that umbra. And the penumbra is gonna be partial red, right, as, the, as it goes through the umbra. Uh, as it goes through the penumbra and into the umbra, it's gonna be partially red as it goes through here, but then it turns to the full blood moon as it's in there. Yeah. How many of you have seen uh, a lunar eclipse? It's pretty cool stuff. How about a solar eclipse? Partial solar eclipse. Okay, no one's, ah, oh, really? All right. Solar eclipses are cool. I mean, partials aren't as cool. I've never seen totality, but uh, I'll show you why it looks so cool. Uh, but here, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the comparison between the nodes and the different eclipses, right? So again, taking a look at the orientation, we have the sun, the moon, and then the earth. This is your solar, you have the sun, the earth, and the moon. This is your lunar. If you look at this perspective, at the descending node, what type of eclipse would you expect? <clears throat> so here we have the, the moon coming down, it's hitting that descending node, so we have the orientation, we got sun, then moon, then earth, right? So what are we, what are we looking at? Solar. We're gonna look at a solar, right? Because you got the sun, the moon, and the earth. So, Conversely, when it hits that ascending node, that's when you got sun, earth, moon, you got lunar. So that's going to depend, uh, essentially that's going to depend on what type, what time of year, you know, you're going to get, what type of, uh, where, the, where the moon is, what, where the nodes are in relationship to the sun, what type of orientations are you going to get out of your alignments, right? So here is again the lunar eclipse. You see, as the moon's passing through the shadow, you have the, um, the penumbra, the umbra, and the uh, penumbra as it leaves the shadow, and then goes off into no shadow. But you can see just the, the, the length, the, the, the size of the shadow, right? So you have, you see, the, if you do a light ray diagram, you have this light and this light from the edges of it, you have all the light, but this light as it hits, if you've watched this path, you see this amount of light, all the light coming from this end also reaches this part of the earth, but it's being blocked. So that's why you have that partial shadow over there. Again, same thing here. The light from this is being blocked here, so you get that partial shadow here. And then the core of it, the core of the light that's being blocked from this angle to this angle, that's going to create your umbra. Right? So it's all those intersections of those light rays. So you should be able to, you know, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear the different light rays as it gives you the different types of shadows. So it's going to be the same thing for a solar eclipse. But here again, this is just another perspective on that lunar eclipse. And here's sort of what it looks like, right? 
if anyone hasn't, so for those of you that haven't seen a lunar eclipse, I highly recommend you, you know, take a peek at one, maybe get like a cheapy telescope or something like that, so you can get a nice close up. You can also use binoculars, you know, any type of uh, magnification device you want to use to get a nice close up view of it. But that lunar eclipse is pretty nice, it's a pretty good, pretty good time. Uh, but here we have that solar eclipse, we have the, the new orientation again, we have the sun, the moon, then the earth, you have that umbra, then the penumbra, right? And uh, that dark shadow, the, the totality, the region of totality, right? That's going to be really small, maybe the size of a town or a city. And that's going to be, you know, that's going to be the full totality. Anything past that's going to be in partial shadow. Mm -hmm. So, and it only lasts for a brief moment of time. And see, here you can see just kind of the, the size of that, that penumbra, you know, and the umbra, right? So the penumbra is that larger circle, and the umbra is going to be that, that dark, Point and so oftentimes, uh, because as you'll find out today, we're going to sort of do some predictions and see when the next eclipse is going to occur, and you can sort of even pick your own place. You say, okay, this is my address. When's the next eclipse going to occur at my address? That's kind of cool. Same idea. We know well in advance when these eclipses occur. Just like my professor was like, we're putting together a trip. This thing's not happening for a year or so, but we're going to go look at this eclipse in a year. So we have these things pretty well predicted. And what that what this basically means is there's a lot of people, a lot of scientists that want to see that totality. They want to do that for scientific research, right? So wherever there's going to be that umbra, wherever that totality is going to be, all the hotels in that area, all the places that you might be able to stay, they're all already booked. Like that stuff is booked like way in advance. Uh, everybody already knows they're all, they've already paid all their money. It's, you know, that's an investment. But the other thing you can do, so so that's if it's in land place, you know, you can you can you know book a hotel a year in advance, and you can see what that eclipse looks like. But the other thing that's even better is when the penumbra, uh, not the penumbra, but the, when the umbra, the full totality of the of the moon's shadow, is over the ocean, right? You can do a cruise liner, so you can get in a ship and you can follow the shadow, which is kind of cool. That way you can uh, you can keep up you can keep up to speed with where that shadow is moving and you can keep that totality lasting a lot longer. So that's what people do when we're talking about scientific experiments. You might have a better time renting out a cruise ship sort of thing. They have cruises for this, like Eclipse cruises. They're already booked. They're booked well in advance. So this is what the solar eclipse looks like, right? You've got the sun there, and you've got the moon as it's coming up from the bottom, as it moves across the sky. Uh, and there you go, you got it covering over the sun, the totality bit right there, and then, oh, no, actually, uh, it's coming from the top down here, right? Nope. Uh, on it? Maybe from the side? It's coming from the top? Yeah. Is it? The moon moves faster, so it's going to be covering it and then leaving. And that's why I want to last a bit. But here the moon is this, so you see the sun on the bottom. Then it's coming down further, so you see the total. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. This, but it, so it's coming from the top down, but in time it's this. So the timeline is this way, but it's coming from the top down. Okay, cool. So you all see that. Nice. So that's totality. That's what a solar eclipse looks like. It's pretty fantastic. Pretty mind blowing. Here's a nice image of it. Well, we got the moon coming from the left, right? And this one, if we do time from right to left, or reverse, if we do time from left to right, it's coming from the right. That's about it. So you might have seen basically what a, this is going to be totality. This is if you're in the region where you're going to get the totality. But basically, a partial eclipse is where the moon uh, isn't directly over it, it's going to be off to the side because you're viewing it from a side angle. You're not from within the shadow, you're viewing it from the side. So the moon's going to be lower in the horizon, so as it passes through, it's never going to completely cover the sun. It'll get close, but you'll have that crescent shape at the top. So it'll always still be bright enough that, that it doesn't completely dim out the sun, unfortunately. But that's the holy grail. That's it. That's totality. And as you can see, I have just like a picture right there. This is pretty fantastic, pretty spectacular. You have here the corona, right? So that's going to be this this outer layer uh, of the sun, right? This gaseous layer. And uh, interesting, interesting uh, question that I don't have the answer to. In fact, I don't, I don't think anybody has the answer to it. The corona. This is a big mystery in astrophysics right now. We have 
But this corona is many, many, many times, millions of times hotter than, than the sun's core. So where what fusion is happening, where that sun's energy is coming from, that source of energy, all that heat coming from inside the sun, this corona is hotter. So we have no idea why. Uh, but it's pretty cool to look at. Take a note, though, if you do look at a solar eclipse, if you do find yourself able to look at totality, or if it's partial enough that it gets dark enough that you can look at it, don't look at it with your naked eyes, because you will be getting your eyes damaged, right? Even though the moon is blocking the sun and you can actually stare at it because it's dark enough, the radiation that's coming from the sun is still jamming right into your retinas. So, so you got you got to be wary of that. They're still being boiled, basically. Uh, basically, don't don't look at the sun during an eclipse. Uh, when I was a kid, long car rides, you know, got boring. This is before I had the Game Boy and the Pokemon. So, you know, what I would do is I'd stare at the sun. Now I have to wear glasses. <laughs> so, don't do it. Although, to be fair, if there was a totality solar eclipse, I would stare at it with my naked eye. I, maybe I haven't learned my lesson, but, but please take from, from my failures. Uh, so that's it. That's the, that's the lecture. I'm going to leave it on that slide. Uh, today, is, again, we got lab eight. So we're going back in time to do that. It's on page something or other. 66? 60, 59. I've got a bunch of stuff to return to you today, but I've also got to organize it and upload it to the, uh, the thing. So, uh, so I can't hand it back out just yet, but do note that before you leave, when you hand in your lab, please make sure to pick up your old stuff as well. Uh, I want to get it back to you as soon as I can. So, so on page 60, 67 is it? You got the graph on page 67? 68 is it? So if you don't have your lab manual, uh, show of hands, who, who doesn't have their lab manual today? Okay, so if you don't have a lab manual, what I've got is I've got, uh, I've got handouts. So you can pick up a, uh, a graph and do your graph on that. Basically, take a pic take a picture of somebody that has a lab manual. So take a picture of the answer sheet, right blank, and then just make a copy out of it uh, on your own. Right, just make your own copy of it. Thing. Unless I have, oh, actually, you guys are in luck. I have I have the answer sheet. Uh, so I ran into this problem when I uh, subferred in. <coughs> So just basically come up and grab one of these uh, as you can use. Uh, so I want to go over, want to go over some things. Uh, so so I want to, uh, yes. Yeah, so you basically just put whatever eclipse you, you want to be uh, specific. Right? So you have two types. You have the solar and the lunar. So you got to be specific. So let's take a peek. Let's take a peek at what we got. So we got the page 67. So the, so the idea behind this lab is pretty straightforward. Just look at the instructions. I mean, it's really straightforward. You fill out the table. Super, super not too bad. Right? In the bowl, it says, on August 21st, 2017 at 9 a.m., what do you see? It's not a question. It's not a numbered question. But it is a question that I expect an answer to. Uh, and I do take off points if it's not there. So make sure you answer that. Just set the time to that thing. Look at what you see. And then tell me what you see. So obviously it's going to be a type of eclipse, but you have to tell me what type of eclipse. Don't just write eclipse. You got to write whether it's a lunar or whether it's a solar, right? So you got to remember, you got to remember the, the orientation. All right. All right. So for those for those of you that have already filled out the table, uh, I, uh, Okay, basically the idea is you fill out the table and then you're going to graph the table on your graph, right? It's pretty straightforward. The question is, okay, well how accurately do I have to graph it? My data table has got stuff like 321 degrees and 56 arc minutes, right? So it's pretty accurate. Do I need that level of accuracy on the table? No. Because each tick mark represents a lot of 10 degrees, right? So I'm not going to be able to expect you to get arc minutes and stuff in there. So it's just your best approximation. 
But the way you're gonna approximate that, of course, is by rounding on the arc minute. So round the arc minute into the nearest degree. But here's the caveat, and it's extremely important. On the ecliptic latitude, you're gonna have two spots, two dates, where it corresponds to zero degrees, right? What, what does the zero degree latitude correspond to? The, the nodes, right? It's one that corresponds to a node, that's really good. But if you've got something like zero degrees and 51 arc minutes, the question then becomes, do I round it up to one degree or do I, what do I do? leave it zero degrees? So here's the, here's the thing. If you get zero degrees for the latitude, don't round on the zero degree, just leave it alone. Just look at it as zero degrees, don't round that. Because that's your node and you need to note that. So, so if you ever see a zero degree in your table, put a star next to it and say, I've got a node. Because that's gonna help you for number one or two. So, uh, you guys got the table filled out, or what are we looking at? Sorry, I mean, I, I know it's just circled up, but people start working on separately. Okay, so you guys, I guess, fill out the table, and then we'll, I'll, I'll come back in like a minute or two, and I'll explain that like number one and two a little better. Uh, I'm sorry? That way I can uh, organize the tag. So I can get your tech back in. <laughs> 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 